We got some words for you. We've traveled many a mile over valley and river bend, crossed endless rivers and mountains to find the rainbow's end. The days into months have lengthened, the months into years gone by. Our faith in God's plan is strengthened as we search for that rainbow in the sky. And the Lord called His people Zion, city of angels, tower of light. And the Lord called His people God in His wisdom and mercy Now and then brings the rainbow to view And we bask in the beautiful splendor Of the promise that we see in the bow We struggle, we fall, we move forward A people now tested and tried God's people for Zion have gathered While others for Zion have died and the Lord called his people Zion city of angels tower of light and the Lord called his people Zion home of our Savior Christ, sing it again. And the Lord called his people Zion, city of angels, tower of light. And the Lord called his people Zion, home of our Savior, Jesus. Christ. Yes, it's the home of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're ready for ancient words. It's the movie.
sound of it next. Not the sound of it. Good evening. Good evening. The prelude was by Michael and Diane, brother and sister, um, Jordison, and we're happy they're with us and trust that you were enriched by the, the music they shared. How many of you believe in Zion? Okay. The Lord called his people Zion because they were of one heart and one mind and dwelt in righteousness and there was no poor among them. So that's our task to be in one place and have one heart and to be the people of God that he'll walk among us, talk with us, and remake us into his image. I want to welcome you tonight in his name. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we're doing. I asked a couple people to sit in the front row so there would be room for others, but um, if you've been asked to speak, you're supposed to come up front unless I told you not to. Maybe people have abandoned us. I don't know. Um, well, anyway, we'll see, we'll see if we run out of people. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'd like to open with a scripture from the book of Moroni. And again, I would exhort you that you would come unto Christ and lay hold upon every good gift. We're going to be led in prayer this night. We're going to ask that Brother McGee might storm the gates of heaven and persevere, that mercy would come down, crown our counsels with wisdom, that we might be lifted up into heavenly places this night, sit at the feet of our Savior, and bask in the truths of the everlasting gospel. Brother McGee, will you come forward? Our Heavenly Father, we come before thee at this time with gratitude in our hearts for being here together to fellowship with one another and to celebrate and be thankful for the wonderful gift of the Book of Mormon as we are all able to recognize its truthfulness and apply it into our lives that it brings joy and happiness to us and our families and for this we are indeed grateful. We're thankful for all those that prepared so diligently that we're able to have this symposium and this evening before us. We ask a blessing to be upon all those that will speak, that they will have the Holy Spirit to be with them as they impart truth. Again, Father, we invite the Spirit to be in this meeting that will fill of your presence as we discuss things pertaining to thy gospel. We are indeed grateful again for the Book of Mormon as it draws us closer to thy son, Jesus Christ, as he is everything. We are indeed grateful for him and the sacrifice that he did so willingly for us because he loves us as thou loves us, Father. We open this meeting again, pleading for the Spirit to be here with us. And this we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I had the privilege to visit Brigham Young University on several occasions. And during that time, I attended eight separate classes where I sat in as a student. And I was so impressed with the class, I went to the dean of the religion department at BYU, the Joseph Smith building, and I said, you know, I've been in eight classes. I approve of what was taught. Therefore, I'm ready to receive my doctorate. Um, they sent me a journal every quarter. I haven't gotten that yet. But tonight, you're going to have that experience. Brother Stephen Tager is going to spend about 30 minutes, and he's going to teach an interactive class on how to share the Book of Mormon. I ask for him your undivided attention, and I trust that you will be moved as I was moved while I was there. And there's a unique thing they do at BYU. They take a topic that we all might believe in. Perhaps it's baptism, and many of us were baptized many years ago. But they take the concept and make it fresh and say, how does my baptism affect me today? How is it a part of my life? 
How is the atonement an everyday part of my life? Whatever the topic is, it's become alive. And so we ask, uh, Brother Stephan, if you would begin now. Thank you. Again, I'm so excited and grateful to be here. Uh, Scott, do you mind going back there and pulling up that PowerPoint for me? I really appreciate the chance to talk about the Book of Mormon with you. I shared the Book of Mormon on a two-year mission in Las Vegas. The first day of my mission, it was over 100 degrees. I think it was 113. It was July 2nd in Las Vegas. I got off the plane, and it felt like someone had opened up an oven. And uh, it, was, it was exceedingly hot. And I, I, I walked around sharing the Book of Mormon with as many people as I possibly could. And uh, I, I'm so grateful for this chance to talk, talk with you about it tonight. If, if it, uh, the situation appears, we'll, we'll do some interaction as well. We'll, we'll uh, maybe talk with each other and we'll uh, focus on how to share the Book of Mormon effectively. Okay, thank you. So whether it's in a big city or in a small town or maybe in your own home, all of us would love to learn how to better and more effectively share the Book of Mormon with people we deeply care about. Care about. But sometimes it's, it's very difficult. Uh, for example, the CFO of a large company who makes millions and millions of dollars every year, is he interested in the Book of Mormon? Or the college kids and spring break, sitting by the ocean, white sand, listening to some music, uh, if, if I walk up to them on the beach, are they interested in the Book of Mormon? Or the retired philosophy professor hasn't believed in God since he was 15 years old, sitting on a park bench? And what, what on earth do I do to share the Book of Mormon with him? Uh, so we're actually going to look at the Book of Mormon and how it teaches us how to share the gospel. The Book of Mormon can be an extremely insightful text, maybe the best, on how to share the Book of Mormon. And there's no better story, than in, in my opinion, than in Alma chapter 17 in, in my tradition's text, which is the story of Ammon, which is really the story of how to preach the gospel to people who don't want anything to do with it. So tonight we're going to answer this question. How do you share the Book of Mormon with people who are not interested? <laughs> you could. <laughs> That'll get their attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. This is a... This is a Book of Mormon map. It's not supposed to be on any particular spot. But as you know, the sons of uh, Mosiah are coming back from a mission to the Lamanites. And who do they meet? Who do they find? That's right, they find Alma, absolutely. And they rejoice. And we get this flashback in, in my tradition, Alma chapter 17. And I, I deeply apologize. I wish I had the other uh, editions of the Book of Mormon uh, up here. So uh, forgive me for not doing that. There you go. That's, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and feel free to help out as much as you'd like. And the Lord said unto them also, to the sons of Messiah. Now watch for the specific attribute the Lord says, this is what will lead you. This is what will lead you to be able to preach the gospel well. Go forth among the Lamanites, thy brethren. First of all, that's interesting right there. These are not others. These are your brethren. And establish my word. Yea, ye shall be patient in long suffering and afflictions, that ye may show forth good examples unto them and me. And I will make an instrument of thee in my hands unto the salvation of many souls. Now I'm going to ask you a question really fast. And when you answer, will you just be brief and, uh, and, and just answer quickly and we'll just take one or two? Let me just ask you, in preaching the gospel and sharing the Book of Mormon with others, why do you think patience is so important? What is it about that attribute of all of the ones the Lord could have mentioned? Why do you think patience is so important when we share the Book of Mormon with others? Any thoughts? Uh, yes, please, say that, say that again. Respect. How come, brother? Uh, you show respect for the listener and give him the opportunity to bring his questions or his comments. Absolutely. What's your name? Richard. Richard, if you were in my BYU class, you'd get an A. So, <laughs> any other thoughts? Please. Yes. Uh, God could come on Fox News or CNN at any time and say, this book is... <laughs> right, right. But he, but he chooses to seep through the culture, through our testimonies, right. and as 
the way he's ordained it, he says, I, I thank thee, Father, has hidden these things from the wise and the prudent. That's right. In philosophy, we call this the hiddenness of God. Rather than revealing himself outright, he allows us, he works through culture and time, and he reveals himself subtly through, the, through his spirit and other means. Thank you so much. One more, please. Right. Like, what is this? Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> Perfect. I remember when I was preaching the gospel in Las Vegas, I was teaching a young man. He was 17 years old. And some traditional Christians showed up with very good intent. And we met in one of our Relief Society rooms. And um, I... Uh, Man, I'm so sorry. I normally tell this person as if it's someone else because it's a little bit of me patting myself on my back. I'm so sorry. Should I just, I'm just going to continue the story, and I'll try my best to be humble as I tell the story. Is that okay? Okay. All right. I usually just act as if it's someone else, but I already started going, and so you caught me in the truth. Okay. Um, and uh, these uh, traditional Christians had brought a list of concerns with the restoration. We just did our best to answer kindly and patiently. Well, the 17-year-old kid, he got baptized, uh, joined my, my tradition, served a mission for my tradition, and he came home, and he called me, and he said, do you want to know why I joined the church? And I said, sure. And he said, do you remember that time we met in the Relief Society room? You didn't argue with those people. You didn't debate. You stayed calm. And so uh, I, I, this is one of the few places on the earth I can ask this question, and I know you'll know the answer. What is one of the first things that Jesus says when he shows up to the Nephites? And he says, the spirit of contention is what? Of the devil. Right? So we're patient. We're patient when we preach the gospel. Ammon walks in, and what's his welcoming party? This. You're under arrest. That's what they say. And just as Jesus of Nazareth came into this world and came into our space and took upon himself flesh and blood and learned what it was like to be human, fully in that sense our job as believers in the book of mormon is to enter into the world of others to be patient and learn about them learn their stories connect with them spend time with them serve them not as if they're some number but as if they are a child of god because that's exactly what they are watch how ammon does this he comes into their world he's arrested and this is what he says and the king inquired of ammon if it was his desire to dwell in the land among the lamanites or among his people and Ammon said unto him, Yea, I desire to dwell among this people for a time, yea, and perhaps until the day I die. Ammon went deeply into their world and got to know them and learn about them and connect with them. And so the first step, I think, in sharing the gospel with people, uh, sharing the Book of Mormon with people who are not interested, is we have to enter in their world. We have to spend time with them. We have to learn what they love and connect with them. Ammon continues. Apparently, he was a member of the gym. Look at the size of his arms there. He's exceedingly large. He's, as you know the story so well, he's put in charge of watching the flocks. Some other Lamanites are going to come and steal the sheep. And now they wept because of the fear of being slain. I don't know if you've ever been with someone who is weeping out of fear of death. I imagine it's an intense situation. How does Ammon react? Now, when Ammon saw this, his heart was swollen within him with joy. For, said he, I will show forth my power unto these my fellow servants, or the power which is in me, and restoring these flocks unto the king, that I, may win their heart, uh, that I may win their heads. Nope, doesn't say that. That I may win the argument. Nope, doesn't say that. That I may win with reason. Nope. That I may win the hearts of these my fellow servants, that I may lead them to believe in my word. See, a part of entering into someone's world is winning their heart. The mind is important. Last night, I gave apologetic arguments for the Book of Mormon. I believe in that. But humans primarily were creatures of the heart. And so we need to win someone's heart before we actually win their head. Can, can we try something really fast? Will you find someone nearby and will you just answer this question? Why is it that winning someone's heart is so important before we can preach them, share with them a copy of the Book of Mormon, before we can preach the gospel to them? Why did Ammon wins their hearts first? Will you just turn to someone nearby and answer that question? But the first thing you need to say to them is say, happy Saturday night. 
and answer that question. Why is winning the heart so important? Okay, thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate that. Can I just hear one or two of you, please? Yes. Amen. Amen. Absolutely. 100%. Please. Right? That's right. That's right. Thank you so much. Excellent. Excellent. If we continue, Ammon says this, But behold, every man that lifted up his club to smite Ammon, he smote off their arms with his sword. Now there's a scholar at BYU. His name is Alonzo Gaskill. I think he's spoken. Has Alonzo spoken here? at the? Yeah. He ruined my childhood. Because he made an argument that when it says arms here, he says it doesn't mean flesh arms. He, what, what does he think? He thinks it means weapons. I don't care if he's right. That's not the way I'm going to read it. I just want it to be flesh arms. It's a way better story. I actually disagree with this argument, just so you know. I, you know anyhow, regardless, um, they bring the arms back. Whether it's weapons or flesh, we don't know. But it seems like, in the way I read the text, it means actual flesh arms. And that's what all of you are going to want to talk with me afterwards. <laughs> I just lost all of you because you're like thinking about that. But regardless, regardless, he goes in front of King Lamoni. Now this was the tradition of Lamoni, which he had received from his father, that there was a great spirit, notwithstanding they believed in a great spirit. They supposed that whatsoever they did was right. Man, I cannot tell you how many times on my mission someone came up to me and said, doesn't matter what you believe, all roads lead to God. How many times have you heard that? All the time. How do you cut through that? Watch what Ammon's going to do. Nevertheless, Lamoni began to fear exceedingly with fear lest he had done wrong and slain his servants. There was something about Ammon coming into his world, showing forth his power, winning his heart, that began to work upon his conscience. One of the best ways to get someone to be honest about right and wrong is to treat them correctly, to treat them with righteousness. And then they sort of develop a sense of maybe there is a truth there is a right and wrong. Now Ammon, being wise yet harmless, said unto Lamoni, Wilt thou hearken unto my words? If I tell thee by what power I do these things, and this thing that I desire of thee? Now when Ammon had said these words, he began at the creation of the world. He, after they talk some more, and King Lamoni becomes interested, watch what he does. And this is, our, this is our second thing in sharing the gospel. First is to enter into someone's world. Watch what he does. He says, He began at the creation of the world and also the creation of Adam, and told him all things concerning the fall of man, and rehearsed and laid before him the records and the holy scriptures of the people, which had been spoken by the prophets, even down to the time that their father Lehi left Jerusalem. And so the second thing is to show them a better story. The Lamanites had a way of viewing the world. They had a way of understanding. And what did Ammon do? He came into the world and he said, hey, let me show you a, uh, the truth. Let me show you a better way of understanding reality. Let me show you a better worldview. Let me show you a better story. He taught them the story of the scriptures. So I think that's the second thing. This is an Oxford philosopher, traditional Christian uh, uh, um, theologian at Oxford. He says this, we are called to out-narrate the dominant stories that shape our culture. Do you want to know one of the stories in our culture? It's not taught directly. It's taught indirectly. If you have a lot of money, you'll be happy. That's what people say. If you have a lot of followers on social media, you have worth. That's one of the stories in our culture that gets passed around, not directly, but indirectly. Happiness comes from having all kinds of fun experiences. That's another indirect story we get. And what are we called to do? Give them a better story. By exposing their weaknesses or showing how they are enfolded by our own 
or how they are eclipsed by a more luminous and compelling story. In other words, we tell them a better story. Does Jacob have anything to say about the, the search for wealth? Does the Book of Mormon have anything to say about where our worth actually comes from? Yes, we have to provide evidences for the Book of Mormon, but I think most importantly, we have to show them that the Book of Mormon gives us the best understanding of God. It gives them a better story. Just reading those words will start to do that. I just sent in a book to Deseret Book. We'll see if they accept it. It's the true story of a man in Pakistan. Uh, a friend of mine, when he was 18 years old, getting ready to go on a mission, he got a letter from a man in Pakistan. This is absolutely true. It's in the first chapter. We put a copy of the, of the letter in the first chapter. He says his name is Stephen Andrum, and he's interested in the Book of Mormon. Can you, can you send me more about it? My friend, who I, mean, I didn't know when he was 18, I know him now, he's in his 50s, he said, I had no idea how this man knew who I was. And then it hit him. In, his, in, in our tradition, in the 80s, we used to do this thing where we would write our testimonies in front of the, a copy of the Book of Mormon, put our address in it. He put it in a bin. Someone brought it to Salt Lake. The missionary department sent it with some missionaries who were going to England. A man from Pakistan, who was a traditional Christian, got a copy of the Book of Mormon in England to bring back to Pakistan to tell people why it was false. He showed it to Stephen Andrew. Stephen brought it home. He read the words. It was a new story, a new way of seeing the world. The truth. He brought it back and he said, uh, um, here's the book and the, and the pastor, he called it a disgusting book. He took it back and Stephen said, I, luckily I had written down the address in the front cover from this 18 year old kid in Utah. That starts the beginning of a 30-year of a journey with Stephen coming into the restoration, getting baptized. I just met him in person a few months ago. He was in Utah. There was nothing flashy, nothing spectacular, no YouTube video. All it was was the words of the Book of Mormon, a new story. One way to think about this, uh, as, as we continue to see this illustrated, and Ammon also rehearsed unto them concerning the rebellions of Laman and Lemuel and the sons of Ishmael, the, all the rebellions did relate unto them. And he expounded unto them all the records and scriptures from that time that Lehi left Jerusalem down to the present time. This is a chart I put up in my BYU classes. This is a way you can practice telling people a better story. What does the Book of Mormon have to say about truth? What does it have to say about identity? And how does that compare with secularism? or traditional Christianity. We don't want to downplay or hurt uh, other people, but we do want to show them how the Book of Mormon gives us more light and truth. What does the Book of Mormon say about justice that's new and exciting and that provides new insight? If, if you want to share the Book of Mormon, I would be ready to tell them how it, it, it gives us a better story, the truth. King Lamoni, he prays. And he began to cry unto the Lord, saying, O Lord, have mercy, according to thy abundant mercy which thou hast had upon the people of Nephi. Have upon me and upon my people. Do you see what happens when he hears those words? Something, he did something he's probably never done in his life. He falls over. He stinks. But what does his wife say? I don't know why all of our branches remember that part of the story, but we do. <laughs> King Lamoni arises, he wakes up, he says he's redeemed, his wife as well. Oh, blessed Jesus who has saved me from an awful hell. Saved is past tense. He's redeemed. He can have she can have confidence in that. Oh, blessed God, have mercy on this people. And when she had said this, she clasped her hands, being filled with joy, speaking many words which were not understood. But that's not the only person who reacts after getting a new story, after getting the truth. Aaron goes and visits King Lamoni's father. And Aaron did expound unto him the scriptures from the creation of Adam, laying the fall of man before him in their carnal state. Also the plan of redemption goes into their world, gives them a better story, which was prepared from the foundation of the world through Christ for all 
whatsoever would believe on his name. And it came to pass that after Aaron had expounded these things unto him, the king said, What shall I do that I may have this eternal life which thou hast spoken? Yea, what shall I do that I may be born of God, having this wicked spirit rooted out of my breast, and receive his spirit, that I may be filled with joy, that I may not be cast off at the last day? They hear the word of God, and over and over and over again, it causes characters in the Book of Mormon to do the same thing. Behold, said he, I will give up all that I possess, yea, I will forsake my kingdom, that I may receive this great joy. But Aaron said unto him, If thou desirest this thing, if thou wilt bow down before God, yea, if thou wilt repent of all thy sins and will bow down before God, and call on his name in faith, believing that he shall receive, then shalt thou receive the hope which thou desirest. I, I can't believe that we get to see this moment. It almost seems too sacred to write down. We get to overhear uh, the first repentant prayer of someone seeking God. Oh God, Aaron hath told me that there is a God. And if there is a God, and if thou art God, wilt thou make thyself known unto me? And I will give away all my sins to know thee, that I may be raised from the dead and be saved to the last day. And now when the king had said these words, he was struck as if he were dead. How do we help someone receive the Book of Mormon who's not interested? First, we enter their world. Second, we show them a better story. And then we invite others to have a direct experience with God. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you a question. How come that last part is so key? We can get to know them, build a relationship with them. We can show them how the Book of Mormon is the truth and explains things uh, more clearly. But that's not enough. Eventually, they have to turn to God and have a direct experience with him about the Book of Mormon. In your opinion, and your thoughts, why is that so essential in, in this process? Please, brother. Amen. Thank you. I love that. Me too. Me too. Anyone else? Please. That's right. How come? Why do you think that is? That's such a, a beautiful answer. Yeah, why do you think that spiritual experience is, is the, such a powerful glue? That's right. I think so. I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please, in the back, yeah. Yes, ma'am. She said it's the glue that keeps, keeps you, uh, to, so you can endure to the end. My father came into the restoration when he was stationed in Germany. And I just heard him a few years ago say, those sacred, powerful experiences I had have just always stayed with me. And of course, he's had more since then. But you're absolutely right. Thank you. One or two more thoughts. Why, why is this such an essential part of the process? Please, brother. That's right. That's right. We're not trying to get people to come unto a book. We're trying to get them to come unto Christ. It's the Book of Mormon that we think is essential in doing that in the latter days. But that's the end, end result. Thank you so much. Please. Hmm. Amen. Abs Truth. Absolutely. Please, brother. Yeah. So they have to get their subjective witness as well. Thank you. Thank you. One more comment. I love that. Thank you. Please. Hmm. 
I love that. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I know many of our branches in here have different thoughts and opinions on the, on the first vision. So will you, just, will you just do your best to, you pull out whatever you need from this example. But in my tradition, the way we understand the story is that as long as Joseph was talking about the Bible, discussing the Bible, listening to other people debate the Bible, Satan was not afraid didn't show up but when he walked into the grove and tried to have a direct experience with God that's when the gates of hell began to shake because he knows as soon as that 14 year old boy begins to speak to God directly that light will show up and the whole world will be changed forever brothers and sisters in the restoration May we enter into other people's worlds. May we show them that the Book of Mormon is the truth. And may we invite other people to have a direct experience with God for for themselves. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Stefan. The Book of Mormon's message was designed by God to magnify the book's dynamic, formidable, and encouraging witness of Jesus Christ, inviting all people throughout the world to come unto him. What do fellow Christians know about our witness, the Book of Mormon? Have they heard us share its message? Do they sense our enthusiasm? If we were accused of promoting the Book of Mormon in a court of law, would we be accused and found guilty or would we be acquitted? The remarks of those that you will hear tonight are to enlarge our belief in and appreciation for this book, as well as all of us who desire to embrace it. The purpose of the rally is to engender support, excitement in a demonstrative way, causing each of you to be thrilled, electrified, and animated with his message. That as a people, we might begin reading it, studying it, sharing it, preaching it, living it, and faithfully testifying of the power of the promises couched within her. Tonight at this rally, we have the opportunity to hear about this remarkable record by several who have a testimony of the book's divine nature as they've plumbed its depths to uncover its unfolding treasure of riches. Their remarks are meant to enlarge our belief in and appreciation for this book, as well as all who will embrace it. A new day is soon to dawn upon the world and the message of the Book of Mormon will come into focus. A couple of years ago, I was privileged to travel to Tahiti to do some missionary work, and accompany me on that trip were several brethren, including Brother Michael Jordison. Michael Jordison is going to sing a song he sang to me in Tahiti, and I was so impressed with it, I asked him if he could refashion it through the message of the Book of Mormon, and so he's gonna share that with you, and when he's done, He's going to stand and bear his testimony of the divine authenticity of this book and what it means in his life. Brother Michael. Bill, it's the trump of the Lord. Oh, that I were an angel and could have the wish of mine heart that I might go forth and speak with the trump of God, with a voice to shake the earth and cry repentance unto every people. Yea, I would declare unto every soul, as with the voice of thunder, repentance and the plan of redemption, that they should repent and come unto our God, that there might be no more sorrow upon all the face of the earth. Oh, I love to hear the song of creation. Wind and the rhythm of the rain Oh, the thunder, it speaks of your power There's something that is louder in its way It's the voices of those who have slumber Their echoes crying low from the dust And rising up from the ground Their words will abound Can you hear? It's the trumpet 
trump of the Lord. It's the book of Mormon's day. Let the time of Gentiles fade. Let their voice ring out to the remnant shout. Oh, I hear the sound from tomorrow. Oh, I hear the round eyes will break. It's the trump of the Lord as his word is restored. Let the book of Mormon play. Let the remnant be gathered again. I have heard the chorus of the angels was flying in the midst of heaven's rain. With a song that shouts that Jesus is Savior. For all Israel scattered in these latter days It's the book of Mormon's day Let the time of Gentiles pay Let their voice ring out To the remnant shout Oh, I hear the sound from the Mora. Oh, I hear the round as we pray It's the trump of the Lord As His word is restored Let the book of Mormon Patrick said I had about 30 minutes to speak tonight, so I wanted to make sure that I could stretch this out. I wrote it down for you, Patrick. Now, there have been thousands, maybe millions of testimonies shared regarding the Book of Mormon, uh, from the miraculous experiences of meeting Jesus Christ, or one of perhaps the three Nephites, um, to the more quieter experiences of those who just know that it's true. Now, have you ever struggled to give a testimony? Have you ever faltered when someone asked you to give your testimony of the Book of Mormon? And have you ever wondered, is my testimony good enough? Is it real? Is it convincing? Does it even count as a testimony? I mean, I grew up in the church always believing that the book was true. I heard testimonies of family friends, of those who had miraculous experiences, such as maybe not being able to read and then being given the book, and all of a sudden they could read, and not just read, but to read the Book of Mormon. 
Maybe I don't need a big testimony. Well, I believe that believing on someone else's testimony can be a gift from God, but I also believe that that gift is just the starting point, as our brother shared with us this, uh, just previously. I think God wants each of us to have our own unique and personal testimony of the book, just as he wants us to have that unique and personal testimony with him. Now, if you're like some and you've had doubts and concerns over whether or not you've had a sufficiently miraculous experience that might qualify as a valid testimony of the Book of Mormon, then let me just share a part of my Book of Mormon testimony with you. And that is this, read it, and then read it again. And when you've finished, read it one more time. Now, Book of Mormon apologists can readily identify when those who argue against the book have never read it. Simply put, if your experience for or against the book, it carries more weight when you're familiar with it and its teaching. Again, read it. Now, we all here in this room, we know the admonition given by Moroni as he closed his part of the record. And he wrote, When ye shall receive these things, I would exhort you that you would ask God, the Eternal Father, in the name of Christ, if these things are not true. And if you shall ask with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, he will manifest the truth of it unto you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And by the power of the Holy Ghost, you may know the truth of all things. But here's the kicker. Before you do that, there's something else that's required. We don't just ask to know if the book is true. For in the preceding verse, Moroni says this, Behold, I would exhort you that when you shall read these things, if it be wisdom in God that ye shall read them, that you would remember how merciful the Lord has been unto the children of men from the creation of Adam even down until the time that ye shall receive these things, and ponder it in your hearts. Read the book. Remember how merciful God has been to all mankind, including me, including you, and ponder these things in your heart. And then ask the Lord if these things are true. And the testimony comes in this way, and I think this is the important part. It says that God will manifest the truthfulness to you by the power of the Holy Ghost. And for some here now, that might mean oh, maybe a warm, fuzzy feeling inside. Um, I've heard it described as a white-hot flash, an aha moment, maybe a quickening of the mind, or maybe an angelic witness to confirm it directly to you. But let me offer you one other viewpoint on this, and this is where I draw my testimony regarding its truthfulness. And it's in this word, manifest. He will manifest the truthfulness of the book by the power of the Holy Ghost. And of the 60-some instances of the word manifest in the Book of Mormon, the overwhelming majority refer to Jesus Christ revealing himself either in the flesh or by the power of his spirit. And shortly after finishing his account, Moroni then goes on to write the title page of the book. In the title page, we find Moroni explaining the purpose of the Book of Mormon, and he includes this line and also to the convincing of the Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God, manifesting himself unto all nations. And so we see that Moroni ensures that the Book of Mormon both begins and ends with this concept of the word manifesting, manifesting to the individual and manifesting to the world. And to make sure we don't miss this point, in his abridgment of the record of Ether, he also says this, Behold, this is a choice land, and whatsoever nation shall possess it shall be free from bondage and from captivity and from all other nations under heaven, if they will but serve the God of the land, who is Jesus Christ, who hath been manifested by the things which we have written. Jesus Christ, who is manifested by this book. The Book of Mormon is a testimony not just about Jesus Christ and his dealings, his experiences with this lost branch of the house of Israel. The Book of Mormon is a testament to the revelation of Jesus Christ 
who has come in the flesh and who will again come in the flesh and who reveals himself in and through the power of the Holy Spirit to those who diligently seek him. To have a testimony of the Book of Mormon necessitates that it leads us to have an experience with the risen Lord. We can believe the book, we can trust that it is authentic, but for me, the real testimony is whether or not it nourishes and fosters my relationship and your relationship and the remnant's relationship with the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the God of Lehi and of Nephi and Alma and Moroni and so many others. That's the purpose of this book, that Jesus Christ will be manifested to you and in you and through you. Amen. Brother Jim, will you come forward? Brother Jim McKay? And bear your testimony? I've known Jim all my life. And I've tried my best to raise him properly. And now is the big test. Brother Jim. Well, thank you, little brother. This testimony that I would like to share t tonight is re recent. It's as recent as about the middle of February. I make it a habit to read the Book of Mormon each year. Uh, Brother Gary and I were traveling uh, to Nigeria and leaving on the 20th of March, and I wanted to make sure I had finished before that mission assignment. So sometime in February, I read from our eighth chapter of Mosiah, the 15th chapter in everyone else. This is edition. I read words that I had read at least three dozen times. And I never saw this. Maybe that's your experience too. That's one of the joys and wonders of never stopping to mine for the treasures that are in God's word. And this is the account where the prophet of Benedi is speaking to the wicked king Noah and his wicked priests. And he quotes a line from the uh, 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And as a sheep before the shear is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Uh, Benedi goes on and he talks about how he was led and crucified and slain. A little bit further, he says, And thus God breaketh the bands of death, having gained the victory over death, having given power to make intercession for the children of men. Tonight, I'm not going to be able to in any way share with you what happened when I read those words, but I am, am hopefully going to be able to explain the process of what happened to me when I read those words that Christ was given the power of intercession. You'll remember when Amulek and Alma were ministering amongst uh, the Zoramites, and I'm going to be in the 16th chapter, which is the 32nd chapter. And Alma tells the Zoramites about an experiment that he would liken the word of God into a seed. And that if you had nothing but desire, you could plant the seed. And that you could experiment upon the seed. You would have to nourish it. You would have to water it. You would have to fertilize it. He didn't use the word fertilizer. <laughs> but you fertilize it. And he says if it's a good seed, it begins to grow. In fact, he says that if it's a good seed... It beginneth to enlarge my soul. It beginneth to enlighten my understanding. It beginneth to become delicious unto me. And it reaches the point where he says that your knowledge is per perfect and your faith is now dormant. Now, he's not saying your faith in general is dormant. He's talking about on that specific thing. 
that your faith is dormant. I'm going to pause there for a minute and jump to a little further in the chapter where Amulek is talking to the Zoramites about the need for an infinite and eternal sacrifice and that the Son of God would be that sacrifice. And because of that sacrifice, mercy could satisfy the demands of justice based on the requirements of exercising faith under repentance. We all know those are the first two steps in the doctrine of Christ. Mormon would tell us later that the first fruits of repentance is baptism and then cometh the visitation of the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Later in the 19th chapter in uh, Alma, as he speaks to his son Corianton, you know in some ways it's a good thing Corianton was a wayward son. Do you realize how much we got because he was, was a wayward son? Uh, but I'm glad he was redeemed in the end. And he talks about this same process of mercy and justice and how justice cannot be robbed. There is a price to pay. And he uses the word mercy can appease the demands of justice. And so we go back to this experiment that Alma is talking about. And we reach a point where he says, your understanding doth begin to be enlightened and your mind doth begin to expand. Oh, then, is this, is not this real? I say unto you, yea, because it is light and whatsoever is light is good. And I, I would testify to you that that is the light of Christ that he's talking about. And he says it's discernible. And in the 1828 Webster's, discernible is defined as seen with the eye or understanding. Because of the light of Christ, we can come to understand things as we experiment upon the word. And so when I read those words that because of the atonement, Christ was given the power of intercession. And when I say I understood, uh, I'm not saying I understood much, but I had an understanding. It is because of the atonement and the gift of intercession that's given to Jesus that mercy is now empowered to appease or satisfy the demands of justice. All I've done is explain to you something that I cannot tell you what actually happened to me when I read those words in Mosiah. But the process of what Alma has shared allows me to somehow give expression to you of these miraculous words that the prophet of Benedict delivered. And those words are for you and I today. This book is a testament for us. This was not written in the state in which we have it for anybody but the people that would come forth in this dispensation of the fullness of times. Now, I want to say one thing about testimony. I don't think there's a person gathered here tonight that if they had the opportunity that they would turn down a visitation from a heavenly being, holding the plates, turning the pages perhaps, announcing that this is the record which Joseph Smith Jr. translated from, and it is the word of the Lord. I don't think a person here would turn that down. God giveth to men severally as he willeth. Now that's taken out of 1 Corinthians 12 and the gifts of the Spirit. But this is a gift of the Spirit. And whether an angel appears to us or through the process of our minds being expanded revelatorily to understand the things which are divine, that bear witness of Jesus Christ and the hope of his kingdom, it is the self-same Spirit. And we should never try to compare our testimony to anyone else. God has given to us severally as he willeth according to our need that we might be his witnesses in the earth. 
So I bear witness to you, and I could bear witness on many other testimonies that I've received, but I bear witness to you on this testimony that the book is divine. It is a restoration of the covenants that God made with our fathers, the prophets, because God is a covenant-making God. And if we want to be in God's presence, we're going to have to make covenant. But it all happens through the Savior, Jesus Christ, the Holy Messiah. And so you've heard the words that Michael just read to convince Jew and Gentile that Jesus is the Christ, the eternal God. I bear witness of Jesus. I bear witness of this record that bears witness of him. It is the most Christ-centric thing you can lay your hands on and read. There is no other book of Scripture, and I'm not speaking down about any other books. There is no other book of Scripture that bears witness of Jesus Christ as the Book of Mormon does. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. My good friend Stephen Pinecker is not going to speak next. But he's going to speak in a little bit. But Stephen had a conversation with me, and he told me about his friend David, David Bose who visited 52 churches in 52 weeks. And I want you to hear the testimony of an individual who is not born and bred in the Restoration, but who has visited saints in the Restoration and how the testimony of God's people has impacted and inspired him and moved him and persuaded him to come and speak to you tonight. Brother David, welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Patrick. Uh, my name is David Boyce. Uh, I'm a lifetime Protestant. Uh, I have a YouTube channel called 52 Churches in 52 Weeks, where I essentially check out a different church each week. I am an intentional church hopper. A little weird. Uh, but over the past year, uh, I wrapped up two weeks ago, and uh, I've gone to all kinds of different denominations, all kinds of different faiths. Uh, I've gone to Viking churches, biker churches, just churches of all kinds. And I finished it up two weeks ago going to one of the last snake handling churches. Don't worry, I didn't bring any snakes with me. They'll be all right. But one of the most fascinating uh, journeys that I was on while doing so was week nine. Uh, I had a friend who mentioned, you should go to a Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints type of church. And I didn't know anything about it. Uh, the, 20, like uh, one hour before I went to my first ward visit, I didn't even know who Joseph Smith was. And I'm watching a YouTube video before I, I attended the service. And I had heard Latter-day Saints are friendly. I'm like, yeah, right. That's what they all say. And I just took a seat in the very back. And I had uh, two amazing members. I still remember their names, June and Kevin. And uh, they were just so kind and warm and welcoming to me. And I'm just sitting in the back, what is this? This is so strange. I hadn't had that type of welcome at any other church before. And uh, the service happened, and I was introduced to their missionaries. And they sat with me. And, they, and for me, who had, I thought the Book of Mormon, I thought it was like... Uh, from a Protestant world, we have catechisms. We have different kinds of books that will enhance and supplement the Bible. So this was uh, information overload to me. So that really got me thinking. And I attended a second LDS church. And again, same thing. Uh, then I attended Community of Christ. I learned about the rich history and legacy. Uh, then I went to the Church of Jesus Christ based in Pennsylvania. They laid hands on me. They were an amazing group as well. And uh, I also went to uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Stringite Church. And the same thing. Uh, they invited me out to lunch. And as I explored different Latter-day Saint type of churches, I was absolutely blown away by the people. And that was something that I wasn't used to uh, from my Protestant background. So uh, I still haven't read fully through uh, the Book of Mormon. Uh, I do uh, stay in bi-weekly contact with my missionaries, and they, they always kind of fill me in, and I got questions. Uh, but it was interesting uh, with, uh, with the opening song here, uh, Changing Me, Changing You. 
and uh, I had entered uh, my church journey, kind of take a consumer-based approach, like, you know, what, what's in it, like, how can you spiritually feed me? And as I explored all these Latter-day uh, Saint churches and the different types of the branches of the Restoration, um, like, it, they started changing me. And that really got me kind of wondering, okay, what, what is the Book of Mormon? Because I see the fruits, I see uh, the people, and it really fine-tuned me. It, uh, it enhanced my faith. And, um, you know, as, as someone that, that's kind of that doubting Thomas in the Bible, I'm kind of looking, I'm looking at the scars. I'm kind of looking to kind of see everything about it. Um, I, I've just been met with uh, such grace and passion and a kindness from everyone. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. And... Um, with, with those that I've spoken with, uh, especially with the Restoration Branches, uh, I can't say enough good things uh, as I learn more. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. You know, the greatest evidence of the movement of the Holy Spirit is to see a life changed, transformed, remade. Uh, we welcome you. You're always welcome. And we hope to see you again. When I, I met him, I met him on the phone. He said he lived in Wisconsin. He said, I'd be glad to come to drive down and share with you the joy that I have found in meeting people, the restoration. Tonight, as we came to the church, the door was locked. We were waiting outside. My arms were full with all kinds of things to do here. And I met a man named Frederick Heinlein. And he told me he was from Junction City. And he came because he thought tonight was the symposium. And that's because Stephen Pinecker put the wrong days on his podcast, and so I'm going to blame him. But as a result, he came, and he said, I'm a believer in the Book of Mormon. And I said, you are? He said, yes. I said, will you bear your testimony? He said, I will. So, Brother Frederick, will you come forward, and will you bear your testimony of the divinity of the Book of Mormon? Perhaps Frederick was translated. <laughs> I don't know where he went. But should he come back and he gets my attention, we'll let him share with us. Well, at this time, Brother Ron Smith is going to lead us in a couple of Book of Mormon hymns. And hopefully they'll be interactive enough to present them in such a way that it will inspire you and encourage you and also give you a little chance to exercise. Brother Ron. Could you kill the instrument? How many of you are excited about being here tonight? Okay, well, he asked me to, uh, to share a couple of, of uh, hymns. I want to I want to share another song with you that um, might go well with the under 20 crowd, and uh, there's not a lot of representation here, but uh, maybe you can learn this. It, it's the uh, um, marvelous work of wonder. If we could get that up there. Marvelous work of wonder is uh, the Great name of this song. No, it's not great and marvelous. And the chorus goes like this. Now isn't it a wonder, a marvelous work and a wonder, and it's true. Woo! Boop, boop, be doo Okay, you got it? Now isn't it a wonder, a marvelous work and a wonder, and it's true. Woo! Boop, boop, be doo Now I know that some of you are a little bit staid and all of that, but you can do this, okay? It's a slap on your slap on your, on your thigh, and then a clap, and then a little whoop whoop be doo okay? Now isn't it a wonder, a marvelous work of wonder, and it's true. Whoop whoop be doo 
and I don't know if the words are going to come up here, but it is a, a repeat song, so if you just want to repeat with me, um, you can do that. Can, can we get the words up? Okay, let's go to the, the next one, which is the chorus, and... Now isn't it a wonder, a marvelous work and a wonder, and it's true. Woo! poo be doo Joseph was a prophet. Joseph was a prophet. A latter-day prophet. A latter-day prophet. He did a lot of good. He did a lot of good. Moroni said he would. Moroni said he would. Now isn't it a wonder, a marvelous work and a wonder, and it's true. Woo! poo be doo Joseph found the plates. Joseph found the plates. Some shiny metal plates. Some shiny metal plates. They were they were made of gold. They were made of gold. And they were very old. And they were very old. Now isn't it a wonder? A marvelous work and a wonder. And it's true. Poo poo be doo. Joseph had a gift. Joseph had a gift. A God given gift. A God given gift. He made a good translation. He made a good translation. To send to every nation. To send to every nation. Now isn't it a wonder? A marvelous work and a wonder and true. Boo boo be doo. It's called the Book of Mormon. It's called the Book of Mormon. The precious Book of Mormon. The precious Book of Mormon. Anyone can read it. Anyone can read it. Everyone can heed it. Everyone can heed it. Now isn't it a wonder? A marvelous work and a wonder and true. Boop boop be doo. All right. Okay, we're gonna go with um, the morning breaks. This is. Uh, do you have Do you have the words on that? Restoration hymns. I mean, we can sing it, but. <laughs> the chord's very short. Okay. I'll try not to. The morning breaks. This is a Parley P. Pratt song, and uh, he wrote several, and, and he was excited about the gospel. And um, the fact that, that the, the light was shining in the world again was, was a really big deal for him. And um, so he tried to share that. And if we can get that up there, we will. I can look that way instead of this way. It's not going to be big enough to see, is it? <laughs> okay, and you can like uh, scroll up. And down.
That is too fast to do that way. Um, we have one more that we're going to try, and at least the uh, chorus everybody can get, but if you would get on my right hand side, that would really yep, help. Yep, yep. The next song, Bill. When Earth in Bondage Long Had Lain. Oh, good. When Earth in Bondage A couple of years ago, thank you, Brother Ron. A couple of years ago, I visited Brigham Young University, my brother Jim and I, and we got up early on a Sunday morning. We were going to go to Orem, a town right next to Provo, but we decided to walk around the campus. It was real pretty. It went right up to the Rocky Mountains, and we thought we would just walk around and, and, and view the campus. And pretty soon, it was a Sunday morning, and pretty soon we saw young people coming from all directions. And they were like ants coming out of the woodwork. <laughs> and they had ties on and dresses and sweaters. And, and I saw one girl in jeans and boots. And I, I talked to her and she says, I'm going home to change. And I said, well, where are you all going? They said, we're going to church. I said, well, where's the chapel? Oh, we don't have a chapel on campus. No. She said, no, we go to classrooms and lecture halls and gymnasiums. And they said, we have over 70 locations. And each location has three separate wards. And so on any given Sunday in Provo, Utah, there's nearly 30,000 young people that go to church. Praise the Lord. Tonight, we're going to hear a young man who is on his mission. He's given up two years of his life to bear his testimony of those things he knows and most assuredly believes. Elder Thompson, will you come and bear your testimony? Hello, uh, my name is Elder Thompson. Um, I'm on my mission for my church and my denomination of the remnant and of the restoration. And um, like he said, I am here to bear testimony of the Book of Mormon and the truthfulness of the words and the message contained in it. It is an extreme privilege to be a missionary because as a missionary, you get to see people change. You get to see firsthand the experiences that people go through as they come to know God. Uh, in the first presentation, uh, Alma teaching King Lamoni and others, 
We read in the scriptures their experiences, but as a missionary, you get to see it firsthand in today's world. I bear testimony to you as one called to bear that witness that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. I promise you that if you're willing to read and study every day, you will make better decisions every day. I promise you that as you read and apply the truths in this book, you will come to know your Savior Jesus Christ. I promise you that regardless of situation or circumstance, turmoil or trial, you will have an inner peace because you will know your Savior who is the very center and message of the Book of Mormon. As a missionary, I get to see people change. I've seen people who on first contact, there's a darkness about them. They really don't understand life. They don't understand their purpose, their identity. As we extend the invitation and help them and guide them to read from the Book of Mormon and to pray, they change. And seeing them go from that first day to being baptized and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, that change is noticeable and it is miraculous. God truly is in this book and it is brought for our day so that we can know God, so that we can know our Savior, Jesus Christ. I know that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God, and I know that He is real, and that Jesus Christ is my Savior and your Savior. And I share these things with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, there's a lot of churches in the Restoration, and the, the church that Elder Thompson um, works for, <laughs> couldn't use that term, they're the biggest church in the Restoration. And I think there's a lot of reasons why that's true. They would say, well, they're the true church. And I understand that. We all say we're the true church. But they have 60 to 80,000 missionaries out on the street every day all over the world knocking on doors, inviting people to hear the restored gospel. I am so grateful and I have holy envy for the efforts that they make to bear witness of those things they know and surely believe. I'm going to ask Andy Brantner to stand next and bear his testimony. He's a member of the Church of Christ on the Temple lot. And I hope that as he bears his testimony, you might appreciate the fact that here's an individual who is in the center of the center place and they're custodians of a very sacred piece of ground that was dedicated in 1831 with a dedicatory prayer by Sidney Rigdon as the elders gathered on that piece of ground looking, dreaming, and longing, anticipating the redemption of Zion. Brother Andy. Good evening. Good evening. I too brought a note page. It isn't because I don't know what to say. In the Philippines, I'm known as the man not of a few words. And I'm going to try to keep this brief as requested. I greet you all in the name of Jesus Christ, and I dearly thank you, Brother McKay, for this privilege and this honor. I would that I had an offering tonight of an angelic visit, or a voice of thunder, or I saw a light. I do not. Yet I do have a testimony, a testimony of me. I came into the fullness of the gospel over 40 years ago. And I was what I call a concrete spiritual breach birth. I was all mixed up, set in my ways, going backwards, not knowing where I was going. Discovering at one time that some of my family believed in the Book of Mormon, I asked my mother, how this was so, and I was never told or aware. Mothers being able to come to the heart of the matter 
She said, Andy, did you ever ask? I had never asked. The thought never came to me. And in the midst of that sprightly debate, my father injected himself and he said, Son, if you're going to condemn the Book of Mormon, maybe you should read it first. And then we'll have a talk. And so I did. Being a breech birth, I set out with all the wrong intentions. My efforts were to disprove it to all who would listen. I set out not to find the truth, but to find the falsehood. And I was looking at things completely wrong. And as I read, God touched me as only God can. And his Holy Spirit moved upon me and opened my eyes and softened my heart. And my mind began to expand. And the things that were in those gray areas were now quite vivid and clear. Things spiritual, things archaeological. Every question I had in the Bible and Latter-day Revelations was being answered. Not necessarily from the Book of Mormon, but because I had changed. And I could now see. And why? Why for me, O oh God? Because of love. That's why. I could feel him changing me from the inside out. He taught me to turn the binoculars of my heart around so I could see more clearly and draw him near. I had spent my whole life looking through those binoculars the wrong way, pushing God away. And I was comfortable at that time operating in those gray areas and justifying what I wanted to do. If you knew me then, you would know what a miracle that was, that God changed me. And since that time of nearly four decades ago, I too have believed the Book of Mormon. And I have loved the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have been blessed to preach and teach and baptize and do all those wonderful uh, things in many places in this world. And I go today serving Jesus Christ wherever I am welcome, as did my father and my grandfather before him. I am proof that God uses the weak and foolish things of the world to do his business. If I have no other purpose, it is that. And even now, I yet receive hidden jewels of understanding from the pages of the Book of Mormon. Again, not because the Book of Mormon has all the answers, but because my heart is conditioned to receive them. As was said here earlier, I wholeheartedly agree. It's the things that God gives you through the Spirit that stay with you and carry you through those tough times. It isn't what you read or what you thought you read or what you learned or thought you understood. It's what God gives you. That's what changes your life, changes your way of being and thinking. Only with his divine assistance will we ever be able to rightly divide the words of truth. And that's why we're here. So the testimony I bear is that the Book of Mormon has changed my life. It has changed me, something only God could accomplish, and he did it beginning with the Book of Mormon, when once I would not believe, thinking I knew, God taught me how to believe, not necessarily what to believe, but how to believe, and now I know. And I have been blessed in that mercy has overruled justice in my life. 
and it is the Book of Mormon that he first used to rescue me. I want to leave you with a personal revelation that was given to me in a dream many years ago. And I'd like to preface it with a couple snippets from the Bible. And if you read the Bible, I'm sure you have, you'll know where, where these are. Of making many books, there is no end. And another from the New Testament, the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. That, those two scriptures were open windows into the heavens. And in this dream, I stood before a flight of stairs that ascended, it seemed, to infinity. And I desired somehow to climb to the top because I knew that was where I would find all truth and peace. An old brother, Isaac Brockman, some of you may remember him, motioned to me with a wave of my hand to begin. I studied the stairs closely. Each step was constructed from books. Different sizes, different shapes, different colors, different thicknesses, but they all interlocked and married together to form a perfect step. And each step was regular in size as the one before it. I looked over the stairs and I thought, what keeps it held up? There are no legs, there are no hangers. I realized that each step supported the one that followed it. It was then that I knew that I had to step on every step only after accepting the truth that was in those books from which it was made. Trusting God, and then I could climb to the next one. Having an accepting heart is the only way to ascend those stairs. And I am still climbing. And that is my testimony. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Andy. Brother Steve Pineker is unique. He has captured something in what I call the constellation of Mormonism. He's done something to help all of us. He's gotten us in touch with one another. And the in people that he interviews are able to talk to others who have been on his podcast, and it's growing immeasurably. And it's an open invitation for people to hear and experience those who are immersed in the Latter-day work. And so Stephen has gotten, gotten us to begin talking to each other. And I wanted to invite him back and let him share his testimony of his experience in the Restoration, and in particular, the Book of Mormon. Brother Stephen. Oh, this is so awesome. I feel at home. I tell people I feel like I'm part of the tribe after doing this for about a year. I realize I'm part of this tribe now. I'm an evangelical Christian, and I should not be here, but I am. And I do believe that God's hand is on this endeavor. And I just wanted to talk a few things. Uh, first of all, within the context of the evangelical world that I inhabit, many of you probably know that, of course, David Boyce is doing some, some wonderful stuff, and I'm very good friends with Pastor Jeff McCullough of Hello Saints. And, of course, he is an evangelical pastor who's currently reading through the Book of Mormon and giving kind of a, a commentary on it. And I contacted him, and it kind of had one of these lightning bolt moments where I was like, dude, you are writing an evangelical commentary of the Book of Mormon. Because you're doing it on your show, you've already got most of the text written out because, so I'm thinking, and he was like, you know what, that's a great idea. Now, I'm thinking, how awesome is that? That maybe in a couple years, and I think it's going to happen, we're going to have an evangelical commentary on the Book of Mormon. Now, that makes it accessible for evangelicals to read the Book of Mormon, 
and it makes it accessible for uh, people of the Restoration to engage an evangelical context of the Book of Mormon as well. And I just think that that's so important because, you know, I was in a roundtable today that Casey Griffiths put together, and this is the first time that non-Restorationists were in this meeting, this annual meeting. Uh, David and I were there. And I just thought it was so important because that what Casey is doing is getting all these different groups of the Restoration talking to each other. Now, we had a glimpse of the millennium, if you will, in the pages of the Book of Mormon when we had 200 years of peace. Now, it seems to be that it's deliberate that we do not have, we only get to see a glimpse of it in the Book of Mormon. Just a little taste. People say, why is it they have 200 years of peace, a, pr a proto-millennium, you know? Cut short. And we only hear a little bit about it. And I think it's because we're not yet ready to have that, to see that, and hear that, that message. But one of the things is that there were no matter of ites. Now, what we have an issue here with the Restoration is we have a lot of ites. Brighamites, Josephites, Cutlerites. So, bring a, Brickertonites. I'm, I'm sorry, I know you don't like hearing Brickertonites, my brothers at the Church of Jesus Christ. But we have all these ites. And the Book of Mormon tells us there shouldn't be any. And so I think that this is what we need to strive for. And then within the context of me being an evangelical, I believe that God wants unity in the body. He is here for a bride without spot or blemish, and he's waiting. And so we as a people need to get going on this thing. I think it's really important. So I also wanted to point out, uh, Stefan, all right, I know everybody talks about these big muscular men in the Book of Mormon. Now, I'm a big Arnold Freiburg guy, and it was those Arnold Freiburg paintings that I saw when I was an eight-year-old boy in the Marriott Hotel that first entranced me with the Book of Mormon. The reason why those men are so muscular, and this is what Arnold Freiburg tells us, is that is because they actually was representative of their spiritual strength. And so that's what that, that was all about. So I thought I'd just let you give you the deets on that real quick. <laughs> but um, one of the things that... Uh, I've been trying to do is causing there to be engagement between the evangelical world and the restoration. So I go to evangelicals who come to me and say, how do I encounter, engage people of the restoration? In particular, people, that, members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And I've kind of formulated this formula called the three questions. This is an evangelical asking a Mormon, or a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and of anybody, of course, of the Restoration. And the three questions are these. What is your favorite Book of Mormon story? Second question, what is your favorite Bible story? And third question, who is Jesus to you? This is how I want the conversation to start. Because, see, for 200 years, and then we're going on 200 years of evangelical persecution of the Restoration. We are at the 200-year anniversary of the coming forth of the plates. Of, of the plates. I do believe that after 200 years, the time has come for us to bury the hatchet and be at the exact, almost the exact center of the Book of Mormon as identified by Christopher Thomas who wrote the book, um, A Pentecostal Reads the Book of Mormon. We have this wonderful story of the anti-Lehi, Nephi-Lehi, I'm sorry, I always mess that one up. <laughs> But at the very center of the Book of Mormon, he did a textual analysis, and at the very center of it is when they bury their weapons. People say that the Book of Mormon is a war document, and there's a lot of war in there, but at the very center of the document, they bury their weapons. The time has come for us to all bury our weapons. We all, on both sides, need to, we all have put arms up against each other. We've all been haters towards each other. We all have not shown Christ active through our lives towards each other. We have not shown Christian charity to each other. And the time has come for us to bury these weapons after 200 years. I think it's so important. And then I like to tell to those evangelicals who are in my audience, I like to tell them that the, the most, one of the most Christian books ever written on American soil was the Book of Mormon. And I talked about this last time in the last rally, is that it is a thoroughly Christian document that as a Protestant, charismatic, spirit-filled Christian, you can embrace this document. And I also like to tell them that on April 6, 1830, we had a church full of spirit-filled, born-again, Bible-believing Christians, them's my people. See, we all are cousins. We're all related to each other. Jo Young Joseph Smith was a Methodist exhorter. 
The pastor would give his sermon, and then afterwards he'd riff on it and maybe do an altar call. That's, that's us. That's what we do. That's what Joseph was doing. And so, th- th- to me, I feel that God has placed me here for this time and place. And when I first started this channel, it was supposed to be a scholarly, secular endeavor. But then I get a phone call at 8.30 on a Saturday night from this guy right here, all right? And I hadn't even taped my first episode. And he started telling me about the Songs of Zion. And of course, I've had Becky on to talk about that. Arlene Buffington's Song of Z- Songs of Zion, really the Holy Spirit's Songs of Zion, as far as I'm concerned, all right? how these songs are supernaturally downloaded into this woman who couldn't carry a tune, couldn't read music, in the flesh just should not happen. And when I saw, when I went to that first service, I didn't even know it was a hymnal, but when I went to the first service of the Church of Jesus Christ and I saw this is a whole hymnal, remarkably supernaturally created. I have never heard of such a story, but because I was raised in the charismatic renewal movement, we are open to this kind of thing. And the beautiful thing, is, see, you got to understand, as a little kid, I never, ever accepted the idea that the canon was closed. I always, that's the Council of Trent that closed the canon. Do you know what the Council of Trent was? That was the Counter-Reformation. They're saying, that, well, no, we've got to close the canon. We don't want anything else happening because we don't want to have a question our authority. And the Protestants fell for that. Well, I, that ain't, see, I'm a, I'm a real radical Protestant. I, I believe the canon, I'm open to the idea that if God wants to give us new scripture at any time, that's his prerogative, and it ain't man's place to tell him otherwise. So we have to be open to the idea that could new scripture could come forth. And, and I know uh, many of you have probably heard my story about how basically I suffered lifelong depression for most of my life. And I was an atheist for a very, very long time. And there was no way... I was ever going to, I was just telling them that we had a second round table at lunch today, and I was talking to them, and they said, there was no way that I was ever, ever going to have faith in God again. I deconstructed the scriptures. I just deconstructed Christianity. I deconstructed my faith. I deconstructed everything. But you got to understand something. I didn't realize it until just a few years ago that I had to go through that gauntlet of depression, hopelessness, despair, and not having anything to fall back on because I didn't have God in my life anymore. But I did not realize until afterwards that I thought I did all the deconstructing, but it turns out God deconstructed me. And I came out a new creature. And one of those things that helped me become a new creature is that when you suffer depression, you start losing interest in so many different things. And then you just start losing interest, and ultimately what happens to people who suffer depression, they ultimately lose interest in everything, and that's when they end it all. But you know, there was something about Mormonism, there was something about the Book of Mormon, there was something about this 14-year-old boy who had some kind of supernatural experience in a grove And this story that so entranced me and defined me and made me who I am, that I realized that not only did Mormonism save my life because I never lost interest in that, and that's what caused me to throw myself into it. And once I realized that, I realized I'm a product of the Restoration. I'm a product of the Book of Mormon. Mormonism saved my life. And I bear testimony that it was God using the, the Restoration that saved me And because of that, I feel that this calling has happened for us to have these conversations with each other and and put aside all the differences that we have and just focus on Jesus at the center of the endeavor. That's why I asked the three questions, who is Jesus to you? I want to thank all of you for blessing me. I get blessed all the time by members of the Restoration, and I, I just learned that I'm going to receive whatever blessings are given to me. I will receive them gratefully. I mean, it's been a fantastic journey that, it, that I've been on. But when I say the trajectory was changed, is I thought it was just going to be me reviewing some books in my bookshelf. I had no idea that I was just going to start doing these book reviews, and then within a few weeks, the authors would start reaching out to me. And I had no idea that this secular scholarly endeavor would ultimately become a spiritual thing 
the three S's, scholarly, secular, but every once in a while, the Holy, every once in a while, the Holy Ghost done shows up at my, on, on my podcast, and he's welcome there all times. And I want to say this, all the voices of the restoration will be heard on my channel, and I love all of you so very, very much. And thank you so much for having me. I, I appreciate you so much, Patrick. God bless all of you. We're going to take a 10-minute break, stretch, breathe, go to the restroom, and come back for more inspiration. <laughs>